give it up. That's where the open land is. Seems like on the East Coast. Let me just interrupt for a second. It might be worthwhile for you to give a little bit of a background about your own situation, so where, okay. you're, where you're coming from. Yeah, okay, where, where I'm coming from. In, I'm, in, I'm in Michigan. Uh, I run an 80-acre farm, beef, pork, chicken. We do field crops, we do produce. I raise a pig known as a mangalitsa. It's imported from uh, Austria. It's uh, kind of different looking. It almost looks like a sheep. It's, it's furry. And in 2011, I was informed that the Department of Natural Resources had issued um, a, what they call a declaratory ruling. The declaratory ruling gave nine characteristics, and if your pig had even one of those characteristics, then they said your pig is feral and therefore has to be depopulated by the first day of April 2012. <clears throat> it seemed quite ridiculous to me, and so we, we checked in, and sure enough, they, they were serious about it. And uh, this is the Feral Swine Initiative that is, they're trying it out in Michigan, but there are 14 other states that are looking at it, and this is one of them, that if uh, Michigan falls and we fall prey to the declaratory ruling, <clears throat> then there'll be several other states that will follow suit. And what this is about, the state of Michigan has said that we have a terrible uh, feral swine problem. And just to fill you in, a feral pig is a pig that has escaped or been abandoned and has rewilded itself in order to survive. <clears throat> so a feral pig may grow longer hair, it may grow longer hoofs, it may get a straight tail, it may, it may have a curly tail, and believe it or not, those are some of the characteristics that the state has given. Straight tail, illegal pig. Curly tail, illegal pig. The only, <coughs> the only carve out they've given it is for what they call domestic hog production. And what that equals to the state is uh, concentrated animal feeding operations. And, and that is where you have a hog house and they'll have 5,000 pigs in there and the pigs are miserable for their, their short lives and they're fed poor feed, uh, lots of drugs, lots of uh, growth stimulants, things like that. All the, all the things that we, we don't like as small farmers. And then to make that worse, they, they have really bad disease problems and they uh, spread that manure on the land and propagate the disease problem. So, so that's what I'm dealing with uh, in Michigan. And it's sort of the same as what's going on here. Um, you have uh, here in Wisconsin, what, what Wisconsin milk producers do not want to have happen. And when I say milk producers, I'm, I'm talking about the agribusiness farm. I'm talking about the corporately held farms. What they do not want to have happen is to have a thousand Vernon Hershbergers that are each milking 30 cows and servicing a community like this. They don't want that. That trajectory is, is a death nail for them. So what they're doing is they detail state agencies like, what is this, uh, Wisconsin? That guy. That guy. Right? They, they detail them to go after them. And those of you that were in there saw, you know, just the display that was, it was disgusting, I thought, you know. They're throwing all this money at this one Amish farmer that's doing nothing but feed his family. So um, the, we're dealing with the same thing. Uh, what's happening to us is uh, Michigan pork producers does not like the trajectory that the family farm is on. In, uh, in just a few sh few short years, we're going to be much, much bigger than we are now. And I don't, I don't mean my farm, but I mean the, the small farm movement. And that equals market share that they will not have. And um, these are people that deal in um, futures trading. So they looked at a trajectory on a spreadsheet, and it's reality. So uh, they want to try and nip it in the butt, and they even use that term, they want to, they want to just stop 
small farmers dead in their tracks. Uh, when, we, when we start talking food in a state like Michigan, you're talking $25 billion in food that's consumed. Now, wouldn't it make a lot more sense for the leadership of a state like Michigan to want that produced, that food, and that, uh, that wealth produced and reaped within the state? But they, they don't see it that way because the politicians are influenced by big ag. So, I don't know. Is that, uh, does that that's, very, that's very helpful. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I, I just would, and we can come back to this. I, I'm, okay. As far as Michigan goes, I, I think we could talk a little bit more because Michigan actually has a, 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 a lengthier history of this whole food rights movement. And um, they've kind of been at both, both ends of the spectrum here. But yeah, I'd like to ask Ajna to maybe talk. When I, when I mentioned food rights in different states, she right away said, said something about, oh, California is the worst. But um, California, you know, I mean, Mark McAfee yeah, talks about, place. Mark McAfee yeah. still, you know, he says that there's some bad things going on in California, but he's, yeah. he's still in 400 stores and 80,000 right. customers, we and he do, looks at Wisconsin and it's a little different. We do in California have laws that protect raw milk and uh, small farmers, but again, we have, uh, California is such a big producer of food, and we have such large uh, mono, you know, mono farmers that are out there planting soy, and most of the central co uh, central area of California has uh, been completely undiverse, uh, unbiodiversified. So I work with some farmers up in Hanford, um, California, and their neighbors next to them are basically poisoning their old trees. And, you know, it, it's, it's, and that's everywhere. I shouldn't just say that that's in California, but I only say that because I was a part of the Rossa matter. And because, because of my experience through that, I went through a lot of... Um, you, you saw the repression. Yeah, I saw the repression. I saw a lot of the charge stacking and the enforcement tactics that really brought down a wonderful community. And there were different variables with that because it, the community itself fell apart and was divided among different uh, factions. So my experience in California with that specific matter was a, a, an interesting one because I saw such devastation. But the flip side of that is you have people, uh, you know, Mark McAfee, for example, who's done wonderful work out there and who is getting across not only in California, but I think nationally, a lot of the small farmer movement and you know the raw milk movement itself. So my seed is very bittersweet. It goes both ways, and it, it's, a, it's a wonderful place because there are laws that are protecting some small you know the small farmers. But on the flip side of that, uh, just like anywhere, the enforcement mechanisms that are being employed by the not only lobbyists, but the um, the enforcement agents, like in, in my case at CDFA, um, it, it's quite astonishing. And I see not only the district attorney's offices getting special grant money, and w at, at the end of the day, I look at where is the money? Where's the money coming from? Where's it going? And why is it at the cost of my freedom? So I look at it both ways. I mean, California also has a, a, a kind of a, a, a very uh, interesting 